Good morning. Welcome to uh, January 1st of 2023. I know you guys all have the same resolution that I do, and we have all accomplished it today. It is being to church on time. You only have 51 more to go, and you have accomplished a goal for 2023. I am going to be partaking in a, another set of, of resolutions uh, starting today, and I'm inviting you all to join me. It's the post-church nap. Times differ on how much you want to spend doing that, but you're more than welcome to join me. Um, but we just want to welcome you here to, to MRCC. Uh, my name is Tyler. I am the youth pastor here at MRCC, and we have a youth announcement, so I get to do announcements today. But before we get to our, our youth announcement, um, we have baptisms coming up on January 22nd. And uh, if you would like to make the public declaration, the next step in your walk with Christ, we would love to celebrate that with you. And so you can sign up online uh, on our website, MRCC Now. Also uh, at the guest center, if you have any questions or anything like that, please don't hesitate to ask. And then coming up in two weeks, uh, it is winter camp for youth. Uh, we go away to Ellensburg, Washington. Uh, we leave on Saturday and come back on Monday. It is MLK weekend. Uh, we are so excited to celebrate what God has for our students uh, at MRCC. And so uh, if you need any information or anything, please don't hesitate uh, to call, email. I'll be in the foyer. Um, and cost is not something that we want to be a hurdle for students to experience Jesus. And so we do have scholarships available. If you have any questions or anything like that, please uh, don't hesitate to give me a call. Pastor Gray's coming up to bring the word. Hey, thank you, Tyler. Well, welcome, church. We've arrived in the future. Here we are. Uh, this, look around. This is what it looks like. You've been wondering your whole life. This is it. Um, I'm still waiting for my flying car. Anybody else waiting for a flying car? They've been promising that for a lifetime. That hasn't happened, but it's good to see you. It's good to be with you this morning. Welcome. Um, uh, again, I just want to emphasize your kids, your grandkids, we want to make sure that they're able to go to camp. So um, if, you know, there's a challenge financially, don't hesitate. We're family. We take care of each other. We want to make sure your kids can go. So that's a big deal. Did anybody uh, like us at our house, did you celebrate Eastern Seaboard New Year's last night. It happens at about 9 o'clock on New Year's Eve, a little earlier. Uh, it's kind of weird to uh, to be here on New Year's Day. I said to Rhonda this morning, uh, this whole week between Christmas and New Year's, it kind of feels like the space between Buckley and Bonnie Lake, right? You're not really anywhere. You're going somewhere and you haven't arrived. It kind of feels like that uh, uh, this week. But it's good to be with you. Um, I want to invite you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 7, and we are going to jump into what is really a prequel for this new year, for where we're going in this new year. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that more in our time together this morning. But Matthew's gospel, uh, chapter 7, um, beginning with verse 13 and down through about those next 14 or 15 verses. And, and let me ask you this, friends. Raise your hand if you know what a deep fake is. Raise your hand if you're familiar. Now, some of us do, right? Probably most of us who know that are under a certain age, but deep fake is a reality of our time. And, and what it means is that we have the technology now to make things appear real that aren't in a way that's profound, that's unbelievable. As a matter of fact, I, I want to share an example with you of deep fake this morning. And um, it comes from a familiar film that you've seen, Home Alone. Everybody's seen Home Alone, right? But have you ever wondered what Home Alone would have been like if the star wasn't a cute kid named Macaulay Culkin? But what if the star of Home Alone was Sylvester Stallone? Give your attention to the screen for a moment. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> Mom, Dad, I washed my hair with adult formula shampoo and used cream rinse for that just washed shine. I can't seem to find my toothbrush, so I'll pick one up when I go out today. Other than that, I'm in good shape. <laughs> this is how you 
nutritious microwave of the macaroni and cheese dinner by the people who sold it on sale. Amen. <laughs> So anyway, you get the idea. You can actually go online and for free, you can watch the entire Home Alone film as if it were played by Sylvester Stallone. And if you didn't know any better, if you were seeing it for the first time and nobody told you that it was a deep fake, it would be hard to recognize that. It would be hard to, to know that that wasn't the way it, it was originally. But that, that's the power of technology in our time. It can make things appear real that aren't. As a matter of fact, I want to share another brief clip. It's just 60 seconds long, but it's another example of the power of deep fake because what you think you see isn't real. Give your attention to the screen again. I am not Morgan Freeman, and what you see is not real. Well, at least in contemporary terms, it is not. What if I were to tell you that I am not even a human being? Would you believe me? What is your perception of reality? Is it the ability to capture, process, and make sense of the information our senses receive? If you can see, hear, taste, or smell something, does that make it real? Or is it simply the ability to feel? I would like to welcome you to the era of synthetic reality. Now, what do you see? Yeah, isn't that interesting? The era of synthetic reality. Think about that phrase. Because church, if you don't know it, we have arrived in that era now. Uh, what we see, what we hear... We have to test in ways we've never had to before if we're going to be able to tell what's real and what's not. I read a, an article in the front page of the Sunday Seattle Times a few months ago that talked about deep fake technology and the ability to, to make things that aren't real synthetic reality. And it caught my attention because the front page, the whole page of the, the article was a, a collection of 64 pictures of people. People of all ages, people from all places, people in all kinds of situations, on vacation, at work, at home, at school, all over the place. And, and it, they asked you, they said, before you read any further in the article, take a look at these pictures and see if you can tell the difference between which one of them are real and which one of them aren't. Which one of these photographs are of real people and which of them are of synthetic people? I had nothing else to do. I was just sitting there. So I decided, all right, I'm gonna, I can do this. I got a, a, a critical eye. I'm a 21st century guy. I can figure this out. And so I went through it and I walked all the way. And I circled this one and marked off that one. And I got all the way in. Then I read ahead and I was stunned to find out the article said, guess what? All 64 are fake. <laughs> Not one real person on the entire page. And they went on to highlight the technological ability that we have in our time to do that. There's silly ways we do it with apps on our phones that don't look real and we can kind of laugh and it's funny and fake and we know it. And then there's the more serious stuff coming at us way faster than we think. And I bring all this up, church, this morning in what I call a prequel to where we're going together as a church in 2023. I bring it up because here's the reality. God is concerned that you and I would be led astray by deep fakes about him. It's not a new thing. It has been the devil's business from the very beginning to portray God as he's not, to lie about who he is. That's what he did with Adam and Eve in the garden. He came and said, is God really like this? Is he really this way? And, and everything that he said was a lie about the truth about who God is. It was a deep fake. And it led Adam and Eve and astray into that first sin. And, and Jesus was passionate about this church. If you want to know something about your Savior's heart for you, know this, he is passionate that you wouldn't be led astray, that we wouldn't be led astray by the, the deep fakes that are always going on all around us. The ideas about God that are portrayed by what Jesus calls false prophets 
are a passionate concern of his. We're going to see that in Matthew chapter 7. And, and we want to understand that, that when it comes to, to battling with the devil, most of the battle has to do with his ideas. There are other forms of spiritual warfare, but at the bottom, at the root, is the battle over truth and lies about who God is. That's why the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 wrote these words. He said, we Christians, followers of Jesus, we don't wage war like the world does. Sometimes we get involved and serve our countries and all that, and we understand that there's a participation that happens, but we know that's not the real battle. We don't wage war as the world does, and the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. We know that guns can't solve sin. We understand that. But on the contrary, our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. And then he makes it very specific. He says, we, followers of Jesus, demolish arguments and every pretension, ideas, which set themselves up against the knowledge of God, against the truth about who God is. That's our battle, is with the deep fakes about who God is. Paul says, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What does that mean in its fullness? We're going to kind of unpack this this morning. But in a nutshell, it means that we, the church, the followers of Jesus, are engaged in a battle to, to, to uh, you know, debunk the deep fakes about God. First in our own hearts, as each of us grows up in Jesus, and then in the hearts and minds of those around us. That is our spiritual battle. And Jesus was so passionate about this. It's what was on his heart in Matthew chapter 7. So let's listen to our Lord talk to us for the next 20 minutes or so this morning about this very thing, about his heart for us with regard to this very issue. Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 13 the Lord says this. He says, enter, Greg, through the narrow gate. What does that mean? We're going to unpack it. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. What kind of destruction? Well, we're going to see in just a moment. And many, many, most, enter through that broad road that leads to destruction. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. In other words, Jesus said, there's a narrow gate that I want you to enter through. We hear that, and we wonder what he means, and we think of a thing we pass through physically, but Jesus was always using word pictures to portray, portray truth because he knew the truth was more than just propositional, and so he was involving our emotions, our feelings, our minds, our hearts in, in fullness. And so he's, he, he pictures this narrow gate, which his contemporary artist would, uh, uh, audience would have recognized, the gate that the sheep pass through when they go into the corral. Jesus says, enter into the safe place through the narrow gate because there's a big wide gate that only leads to destruction. And in his very next words, verse 15, he says, watch out for false prophets. And then he launches into a diatribe about them. So what he's talking about is not salvation per se. He's talking about the danger of exposing ourselves to false prophets, false teaching about God. In other words, Jesus is saying this. There are a lot of dead ends and roads that lead nowhere, spiritually speaking. A lot of them. And most people are on them. But he says, you, my, my people, my followers, the, my friends, the ones I love. He says, I want you to enter through the narrow gate. Now, what does he mean by that? He's referring to himself. He is the gate. Over in John chapter 10, he covers this same issue. And in verse 9, he says, I am the gate for the sheep. So what he's saying is, hey, I want you to let me shape your ideas about God and not anybody else. Not, not other authorities. He says, Jesus says, I want you to let me teach you the truth about who God is. Because there's a lot of dead ends and roads that lead nowhere, spiritually speaking. A lot of teaching that is false by its nature, that doesn't tell the truth about God, because that's the devil's agenda. 
I remember when Ron and I were on our first bicycle trip in Europe and, and we're riding all over the southeast of England and we're following our Google Maps wherever we go from, from bed and breakfast one night to bed and breakfast the next night and we're riding through the countryside and following it and one night we are headed out into it looked like Nowheresville and, and, it, and we couldn't find the house that we were being guided to and the app said keep going. We ended up about six, seven miles outside of a t little town called Faversham and the house was supposed to be there and the it wasn't, it didn't fit the description, and we came up in front of this house that we thought, well, it's got to be this one, and, and so we started to approach the house, and these two rabid dogs came charging up against the fence, barking, making all kinds of racket, we're self-conscious looking around, but there's nobody around, it's a little bit of a country setting, and Finally, we're like, well, gosh, I, the thing says we're just supposed to go in the house through the backyard. I'm not sure I want to go in there where the dogs are. So let's go up to the front door and knock. And so I went up and knocked. Nobody answered. The dogs are going ballistic. I'm thinking maybe nobody's home. And knock a couple more times. Just as we're about to leave, a little elderly lady comes to the door. And suddenly I understood why she didn't answer. She couldn't hear. <laughs> she comes to the door and she says, hello, can I help you? And we said, well, yeah, we're here to spend the night in your, your spare bedroom. And she goes, oh, are you kidding? Not again. <laughs> and she tells us this story that every few weeks, somebody shows up at her house looking for a bed and breakfast that isn't there, that isn't hers. And this has gone on for years for her. And she says, I've told Google, I've called them, I've emailed them, I've written letters. She says, I've tried to tell them this and they never fix it. She says, you actually want to be about five miles over here, this way, you'll see this house. And she gave us beautiful directions to our actual bed and breakfast. And I remember writing away and thinking, you know, we all assume that Google Maps is the best guide. But the truth is that local people are the best guide. They know what's up. They know where we're going. In the same way, Jesus is saying, listen to me. Let me be the local person who shapes your ideas about God. You see, the truth about the Father is singular. Jesus put it this way when he went to the cross. John chapter 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. It's the same thing he's saying here. Enter through the narrow gate. I am the gate. The same idea Jesus is laying out here is throughout. The truth about who God is is ultimately found in this man, Jesus, not anywhere else. Now, let me be careful about this because that's not to say that all other religions are completely without truth. In fact, as Christians, we don't have to say that at all. We can recognize the truth and the goodness and the rightness in bits and pieces of every faith in the world. But we know that ultimately the test of what's true is this man Jesus and what he says. To put it another way, if the question, who is God and what is God's like, were expressed as a mathematical equation, and that equation were four plus three, there's only one right answer, seven. But there's other answers that are closer or further away. Six is closer than two. And in the same way, Jesus says, I'm the right answer to the question. Understand that. Grasp that. Let that sink into your heart. And that's important because let me ask us this this morning. Who are the voices that you listen to when it comes to the truth about God, about what's right and what's wrong, about what's good and what's bad? Many people listen to grandma more than they listen to Jesus, bless her heart. Many people listen to talk radio or the internet or their old dorm roommate or their friends or even themselves more than we listen to Jesus. And the Lord knows that. He knows that's our tendency. And so he says here in Matthew chapter 7, does, hey, no, 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 don't do it. Listen, enter through the narrow gate. I'm the gate and watch out for the false prophets. They are many and the following them, what they say, what they think, leads to destruction. The psalmist put it this way over in Psalm 119, verses 105. He said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word is local people who know the real directions. And Jesus is calling our attention. Now, here's, here's why this is so important. You see, who we listen to makes all the difference. Who you and me listen to, choose to listen, because we all choose. That is what makes all the difference. So Jesus says, verse 15, watch out, be on the alert, head on a swivel, we used to say in the service. Watch out for false 
prophets in contrast to himself. He said, I'm the gate. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. There's a tendency to think that they're harmless, but inwardly they are actually ferocious wolves. You know, Jesus chooses that image on purpose. It fits with his image of the gate for the sheep to come in and out. The main predator for sheep in that time and place was wolves. But also, there are a lot of animals that, that when they're on the hunt, don't look nearly as frightening as a wolf does. If you've ever seen a big tumber, timber wolf on the hunt or approaching the kill, it's pretty terrifying. And Jesus grabs that word picture and says to me and to you, hey, these, these false prophets, these bad teachers about who God is, they're dangerous, like ferocious wolves. And the reason the Lord says this, church, is that he knows that you and I are all tempted to listen only to what we want to hear. <laughs> Can I say that again? That's the temptation of the sinful nature. There's a part of us that only wants to listen to those who say what we want to hear. In the 21st century, we call it the echo chamber, where we surround ourselves with voices only saying what we already think we know. Jesus says, in contrast to that, let me be the one who changes your mind about the Father, who shapes the way you think and feel about who God is. Paul wrote to the young pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and, and he identified this tendency. He said this, the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine, that is, patient teaching about truth, but instead to suit their own desires, they will gather around around themselves a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. See, here's what you and I got to understand about ourselves. We have this natural unconscious tendency, this bias, to only listen to people telling us what we want to hear. And Jesus steps into my life knowing I have that tendency, and he says, no, Greg, I want you to listen to me first. I'm the gate. I want you to watch out for all those other people who want to inform the way you think about God, who want to shape the way you feel about God, the way you behave in, in relationship with him. I want you to watch out for them, and I want you to focus on and listen to me. Because, Jesus says, those other guys, they're dangerous. They're like ferocious wolves. You know, the March 12, 2010 edition of the New York Post carried the tragic story of a, a woman named Candace Burner. She was a a popular school teacher who loved to run in the mornings, lived in Alaska, just outside of one of the larger cities. And um, it was her habit to get up in the morning and run. But one year there began to be notices published in 2010 about a, a wolf pack that was roaming the outside of town. And the state police and the local park rangers said, hey, uh, watch yourself. Don't be going out of town by yourself. Don't go down those dirt roads, forest roads in the wilderness till we get this sorted out. It's going to take a while. We have a wolf pack hunting in the area. And she heard those warnings, but you know what? It was a beautiful Saturday morning. The sun was shining. The wilderness was inviting her. She wanted to go on her usual running path, and she decided to listen to herself only. And the tragedy was that that morning she was hunted, attacked, mauled, and ultimately killed by that pack of wolves. You know, there was a tendency because it was such a beautiful morning and everything seemed so picturesque to think there was no danger. That could have been offset if she had chosen to listen, but she chose not to. And as a result, her family grieves. Her husband, her kids uh, are out, a wife and a mother. The state police and forest rangers are tragically regretting her unwillingness to listen. We have to understand, friends, that sometimes it feels better to ignore and pretend the wilderness is a Disneyland. And Jesus is saying, hey, we all have, you all have that tendency about the voices that teach or proclaim truth about God. And he says, I want you to understand they're ferocious wolves. Let me, let me ask us this morning, do, do you watch out for false prophets? Is that something you're always saying? When you hear somebody talk about God, do you say, hmm, is that somebody I should listen to or is that somebody I shouldn't? Is that someone who is credible and why? Why do I think they're credible? How do I test and measure? Jesus says, I'm the test. I'm the measure. By listening to him, 
we're able to avoid the false prophets. You know, there's people who say it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. Whenever I hear that, I think those people aren't married. Because <laughs> if you're married, you know the opposite is the truth. It's always easier to get permission than forgiveness. When I was a newlywed, my buddies, uh, who I had known as a single guy, wanted me to keep doing what they wanted when they wanted. But I quickly learned that it would be better to ask my wife first. 38 years later, that policy's worked out pretty well. That's kind of the idea here. So let me ask you again, who are the people you listen to about who God is? Whatever you believe about God is the most powerful influence in your life, even if your beliefs are unconscious. And that's true even if we're Christians or not, even if we have no faith. We still have ideas about God. Who shapes those? Jesus says, let me do that for you. Let me help you with that. See, here's the thing. Because of our tendency to listen to only what we want to hear, to put ourselves in echo chambers, what we end up doing is gathering together to be affirmed in what we think we already know instead of to have our minds shaped and changed by a Jesus who sometimes comes to change what we think we know. I remember when I was first learning how to ride a motorcycle, I had to unlearn a bunch of stuff. I had to unlearn that, you know, you, you don't turn by turning the wheel. You push and you lean. I had to learn that when you go into a curve, you don't look at the entrance to the curve, but the exit from the curve. I had to learn about momentum. I had to learn about centrifugal force. I had to learn about road surfaces. I had to pay attention to a lot of things that I never thought were related to driving until I got on a motorcycle. And then I had to have my mind changed. In the same way, Jesus says, hey, let me shape your ideas about God. The Lord talked about this over in Luke chapter 8 when he said this. He said, Greg, consider carefully how you listen. Because whoever has will be given more. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken from him. In other words, if we're only half paying attention, or if our attention is divided among many voices, what ends up happening is that we, we will think we know things and not even know that we don't know we will end up deceiving ourselves unless we have a voice, Jesus' voice, speaking to us from the outside, changing how we think. Now, fortunately, the Lord goes on to say that it isn't hard or complex to tell the difference between a false prophet and an honest one. It's actually pretty straightforward. But it begins with paying attention to the real shepherd, to the one shepherd, to the leader, and that's Jesus himself. As far as identifying the false prophets, the Lord immediately goes on in verses 15 and following. He says, by their fruit, you will recognize. Watch out for false prophets. They're dangerous. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? It's a thorn bushes is a rhetorical question. Of course not. Figs from thistles? No. Likewise, a good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Good tree can't bear bad fruit. Bad tree can't bear good fruit. So Jesus says, look for, the, look for the fruit. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So by their fruit, you will recognize. Now, there's, there's two really simple but powerful ideas here. The first is that you can always recognize a false teacher by what they say and how they say it. Do they use obscenity, coarse joking, hate speech, mockery? Do they play loose with the facts? When you see someone speaking in that way, Jesus says, you know you're dealing with a false prophet. Regarding the tongue, the Bible says over in James chapter 3, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? It's rhetorical. Again, my brothers, the answer is no. Can a, can a fig tree, oh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, those who, um, boy, I just lost my place there. Welcome to New Year's. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring bear fresh water. It's a simple test. Church, understand, wherever there is foul language, whether it's obscenity or coarse joking, whether it's demeaning or mockery, wherever you see those things, you know you're dealing with a false heart, a heart that shouldn't be trusted to inform you about who God is. Wherever there's foul language, there's a foul heart. Jesus put it this way when he said, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. 
It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. Watch the language. James goes on to put it this way. He says, those who consider themselves religious, yet don't keep a tight rein on their tongue, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. They won't only deceive themselves. If we listen to them, they'll deceive us. Language is a dead giveaway. The tongue is the rudder of our lives. So he says, when you hear the, uh, someone speaking about God, listen to their language. By their fruit, you'll be able to tell the difference. And then the other thing is, he talks about by their deeds. And, and, and let me give you an illustration of this. It's, it's kind of a, a little bit grandiose, but it'll, it makes the point. Do you know who in history led the most successful, far-reaching anti-pornography campaign the world has ever seen? Do you know who did that? Do, maybe you would guess it who did that? Uh, I'll give you the answer. By far, because it's no contest. The most successful anti-pornography campaign in history was led by the Nazi party under Adolf Hitler. And as a result, people said, well, they must be good guys. Look, they're against pornography. But all you had to do was listen to the language to know what was really going on there. In the same way, Jesus says, you'll judge them by what they say. A false prophet is anyone who tells you something different about who God is than, than Jesus does. It's the knucklehead who, who, who tries to tell you that you're randomly descended from a monkey. You're not, okay? It's, it's the guy who watches too many movies and tells you that we were seeded on the planet by aliens. <laughs> no, that's not true. It's the sentimental pastor who wants you to like him so much that he won't tell you the truth about sin. That's the guy you got to watch out for. It's the self-serving con man who says that if you send him your money, God will make you rich, even though the Bible is explicit that godliness doesn't lead to financial blessing. It's the culture that tells you you need to feel good above all else, and you must be doing something wrong if you feel bad. But all you got to do is encounter a mom at 2 a.m. taking care of a colicky baby to know that sometimes doing good feels bad. Yeah, but it's the same idea. Our Lord says that false prophets look like sheep. They seem harmless, but they're incredibly dangerous. They're like wolves. And they're most of all dangerous to themselves. Jesus goes on in verses 21 and following to say this about those false prophets. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me on that day, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name do many miracles, drive out demons? And I will say to them, away from me, you evildoers. In other words, there's a whole bunch of people going around telling you and themselves that they're God's people and doing God's stuff and that that's the evidence. And they get to the end of the road and Jesus goes, it was never about me. I don't even know who you are. In fact, what you've done is evil because you have perpetrated a lie about the Father. Because you have propagated falsehood about who God is. Wow, that's heavy. That's sobering. But Thankfully, the ability to discern the difference is easy. It's available to anyone. The more we listen to Jesus, the more we can tell the difference. Sometimes we say, well, I, I listened to Jesus 20 years ago. No, no, no. It's a lifetime of listening. As a matter of fact, over in John chapter 10, Jesus paints a beautiful picture about this listening business. He says this. He says, my sheep know my voice. And so I call them and they come out. The background, the context for that is large livestock sales. When herds of sheep would be gathered, you have multiple flocks in one corral. But the shepherds were able to separate them, not because they branded them in those days, but because the sheep had learned to recognize every individual shepherd's voice. So one shepherd would go to this sh uh, uh, mixed flock, and he would begin to call out in a voice that some of the sheep recognized, and they'd come out. His sheep knew his voice. Jesus says, it can be like that between you and me. But it happens as you listen to me over time, as you let me shape your heart and mind, as you watch out for the false prophets and listen instead to me. You can tell a false prophet by what they say and then by what they do. Real shepherds, and again, John chapter 10, Jesus elaborated on this, they'll lay down their lives for the sheep. Do not choose to open your heart and mind to a spiritual leader who will not sacrifice themselves for you. That's the mark. That's the mark. If they're not willing to do that for you, Jesus calls them hired men, mercenaries. He says, by contrast, he's the one who will give everything for us. And those who are following him, under shepherds who are following him, 
will do the same thing. That's the mark. By their fruit, you will recognize them. When I was in the Marines, we, we knew the difference between the officers who were for us, who would sacrifice for us, who, who looked out for us, and those who wouldn't. We knew the difference. It was obvious. And we knew that when the chips were down, who we were going to follow. It's the same idea here. And, and, and the sad thing is, we're almost done this morning, is that God says that we have a tendency to put up too easily with the false prophets. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul puts it this way. He says, I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may be somehow led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Because if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel, you put up with it easily enough. You put up with it too easily is the literal translation. We have a tendency to just say, well, that's not dangerous. Jesus says, no, Greg, I want you to know that it is dangerous. Some people who preach Jesus aren't preaching the real Jesus. We see that in what we call the cults. Look, I have friends who are LDS. I have neighbors who are Jehovah's Witnesses, but what they're saying is not the truth. It's the broad road, not the narrow gate. So it, it has the idea of cults. It has the idea of, of strange spirits. We'll get into that another time. It has the idea of different gospels that if you give your money, somehow you'll be saved. And They look good unless you're watching carefully. Paul goes on to say such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder because Satan himself does the same thing. See, all we have to do is pay attention. And that's, that's the big invitation as we step into this new year. Because what I'm going to invite us to do as a church, where we're going in 2023, is we're going to spend the whole year walking slowly and carefully through the Gospels and listening to Jesus, hearing from Jesus, learning to recognize his voice. We're going to go all the way from the beginning of Luke to the end of Luke. We're going to take some little side trips into Matthew and Mark and John as we come have occasion because Luke is a chronological gospel. The others aren't necessarily, in Mark's case, to a lesser degree. So we're going to move around among them, but mainly we're going to take a, a road trip with Jesus all the way through Luke's gospel. And the goal of it is that you and I would learn to recognize the shepherd's voice so clearly that it's unmistakable in our hearts. Can I just tell you, that's a beautiful feeling. Can I humbly say, when I became a believer, as a young man, not grown up church, when I became a believer, I, I be became one by asking questions, by seeking, by questioning everything. And when I became one, I said, okay, God, I got here by asking questions, and I know I'm going to stay here by asking questions. So I'm going to keep asking forever and ever and ever. Jesus, I'm going to keep asking and questioning. And what happens over time is you learn his voice. And pretty soon, it's just like there's nothing that throws you off. There's nothing you're afraid of. You're in the corral. There's a lot of other flocks. There's wolves out there. But you know, hey, I'll hear the master's voice. And when I hear it, I'll follow. And it's a safe, secure, strong feeling. That's what God wants for his sons and daughters, for you and I, for his church. So that's what we're going to be doing in 2023, is listening to Jesus and discerning the false prophets. You know, ultimately, at the end of the day, the test of a true prophet is whether they embrace God's priorities. We're almost done, but let me just, we're going to get into this. There is a priority among God's commandments. They're not all the same. There is a priority among them. This is why when a man came to Jesus and said in Matthew chapter 22, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus didn't say they're all the same, learn them all. He said, no, it's a great question, he said. Let me explain, let me tell you. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second commandment is like it. It's to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In other words, these two things are more important than everything else. It doesn't mean that everything else doesn't matter. It does mean that this matters most. And the more we learn this truth about God, the more we're able to discern his voice in every part of our family's journey, our marriage, our parenting, our kids, our community, our work, our church, the more we're able to go, okay, boy, there's several things going on here, but this is the most important. And then we focus in on that one. And the more we do that, the more we have entered through the narrow gate into the safe pasture of the one true shepherd. How do we do that? 
It's just to choose the discipline of listening to Jesus. And that's where we finish this morning. Look at what the Lord says. As he finishes this little talk in Matthew 7, he says in verses 24 to 27, these words. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, he said, I'm the gate. Watch out for false shepherds, false prophets, they're wolves. He said, listen to me. You can tell the false ones by their words, by their deeds. And then he says, therefore, everyone who hears my words and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. The rain will come, the streams will rise, the wind will blow in 2023. Jesus says, but it didn't fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. It is our listening that makes him known to us. It is our listening to Jesus. So he says, my sheep listen to me and they know my voice and I lead them in and I lead them out. That's the goal God has for us in this new year. That's what he wants to build in you and me from the inside out. This ability to recognize his voice because there are wolves out there. They're in our world. They're in our nation. They're in our community. They say ideas about God which do not bear the test of his word, which do not stand up with Jesus. And they're not harmless. They're dangerous. Jesus says, hey, I don't want that for you. Let me, let me finish with a story this morning. And like I said, this is kind of a prequel to where we're going this year. It's kind of a setup to launch into this road trip with Jesus in 2023. I want to invite you to get in the back seat, get your giant big gulp of Diet Mountain Dew or whatever you need to keep yourself awake. And we're going to step into this journey this year deeply. Let Jesus change our minds all throughout the year about who the Father really is. Because there's nothing more worth knowing than the sound of the Father's voice. On April 2nd, 2012, an 80-year-old woman by the name of Helen Collins climbed into an airplane with her 81-year-old husband, John, in order to go visit family for the holidays, something they'd done many times. John was an avid pilot, lifelong private pilot, had his own little airplane, and they just loved to hop around the country. He'd been doing it for a lifetime. This time they were flying from Florida to Wisconsin to visit family, and, and Helen was looking forward to it, but you know, she'd done this a million times. She was never very interested in flying herself. Sometimes John would invite her, hey, do you want to come up and learn? Nah, honey, you do that. That's your thing. She'd go on with her crocheting, her crossword puzzles, her knitting. She just wasn't interested. She never once taken the stick herself. On this particular trip, though, an hour outside of the airport they took off from in Florida, John her husband of 60 years, suffered a massive heart attack and passed away suddenly, right there on the plane in the middle of the air. Helen didn't know what to do. She'd never learned. She recognized what had happened. So she climbed into the co-pilot seat and she did the smartest thing she ever could have done. She got on the radio. She said, my name is Helen. I'm in the air. This is our flight number. My husband just passed away. I need somebody to tell me how to land this airplane. The story goes on to say that a pilot at a nearby airport was called in, and he asked her what she knew. She said nothing. He said, it's okay. You're going to be fine. Just do exactly what I tell you. And over the next hour, even though she had no experience of a pilot at all, that man led Helen talked her through the hardest part of flying, which is landing. And at the end of that hour, she touched down safely, perfectly in his words. And he said, honestly, she did better than a lot of veterans I work with who think they know it all. He said, she did it because she had one focus, and that was to listen to what I told her. Speaking to a reporter from ABC News afterwards, he said, Helen understood her situation. And so she listened. It's really that simple. And in the same way, God says to you and I, hey, I want you to understand your situation. You're here temporarily. We're all passing out of here. We're on our way somewhere else. We don't know how to land. 
but the shepherd does. And as you listen to him, he'll talk you down safely. As we step into this new year, the Spirit is inviting us as a church to climb into this road trip with Jesus through the Gospels, to get to know him like never before. Because when you know the sound of his voice, it's the greatest feeling in the world. Nothing can throw you off. Nothing can frighten you. Would you bow your heads with me? Close your eyes. God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for, Jesus, your care for us, that you would say to us, hey, I want to take care of you. I want to teach you. I want to show you how to fly, how to land. I want to tell you the truth about the Father. I want you to know your maker for who he is. And that happens through me. God, we thank you for sending your son to teach us, for sending your son for us. And God, as we step into this year, it is our prayer that like never before, we would listen. We would get to know him. We would hear his heart. He is the word, you tell us. He is your living word given to us. Help us to listen to him all the way home. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Nudge your neighbor if they fell asleep and uh, then stand up. Happy New Year. This is the future. Uh, the flying cars are still ahead of us somewhere. They haven't arrived yet. But if you want something to reflect on this afternoon, last year was the year that the doc went to the future and back to the future. So we are now living in the real future. But I want to invite you to set your heart on a road trip on a road trip this year, together in 2023, to get to know Jesus, his voice, like never before. Now may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with you throughout this week. Go with God, tell someone you love him. Mm -hmm.